Sheriff Wayne Ivey's world seems to grow by the month. Since we last interviewed him, the sheriff has assumed control of Brevard County Animal Services and school security, and he has proposed taking over policing of Port Canaveral. I'm Matt Reed in the Florida Today newsroom. Today we'll explore the nuts and bolts and politics behind those moves with Sheriff Ivey. I also asked him for his position on Florida's medical marijuana initiative and the winning name chosen by the public for a new bloodhound. Let's watch. Sheriff Ivey, thank you so much for joining us here today. Let's talk about your expanding world of, of, of responsibilities. You've taken on some new things, including uh, animal services uh, in the last year, school security, uh, port police. We'll talk about all these things a little bit, but, uh, but it seems like you've got a lot going on right now. Talk a little bit about, about animal services, for example. Well, you know, um, when the concept for animal services first came up, it was um, it, it was it was an agency that component of our government that um, was was struggling. It had um, kind of gotten in a hole and, and was having great difficulty in getting out. And so, we um, we were contacted by the county manager's office about helping out in the enforcement side of it, maybe taking enforcement under our watch. And so we were willing to do that. And then as it as it continued to progress some of the county commissioners individually started asking us, will you take over all the shelters? And, and you know, Matt, at first we, we were resistant to doing it because we had to look at what skill set do we bring to the table. What, um, you know, on the enforcement side of it, it, it makes a perfect fit. But on Because you've got officers out in the communities exactly. enforcing animal violations, that kind of thing. Yeah, but animal yeah. cruelty, that type of stuff. So uh, then we started looking at, well, on the shelter side, what expertise do we bring to the table, what skill set? And you know, we, we really um, kind of locked onto something and it was that, uh, every day we take care of about 1,400 inmates. We, we uh, feed them, we give them medical, we uh, keep them from getting out, we keep them from fighting amongst each other. Uh, sometimes we got to make them take showers when they don't want to, and we create programs to reintegrate them back into society. Well, that's essentially what you do in animal shelters. And so we, we started looking at the fits, and then we, we realized there's other agencies out there that were already doing it, so we looked at some of their best practices, and uh, we just we felt like with the the aspect that was that was so troubled and and the conflict that was going on with it we wanted to make sure that we were going to help provide a service that's vital to this community and and when you look at animal services it's it's an absolute vital part of our community so i felt like our team could do it and and, and do it um at a, at a greater level than it was being done and so we um, jumped on board and and we're excited about october one that's our official kickoff day so we're i'm we're, um, ready to do it what was the biggest problem is it is it cost? Or is there going to be cost savings involved or was it logistics? What's the you know, biggest um, issue? Initially going in, um, we may not recognize the cost savings because we've, we've got to do some substantial repairs to the facilities. You've got a, a south end and a north end um, facility and, and we've got to do some substantial repairs to the facilities. Uh, you know, the, the issues really came down to um, facilities were just in, in really bad shape. Um, the enforcement side of it was struggling uh, quite a bit and then the adoption side of it was was really what the issue was when you look at uh, the ability to to get the pets adopted whether it's a dog cat uh, whatever it is that's come to that facility we um, we want to increase that the live rate for the the animal shelter uh, Brevard County Animal Services is at 72 percent which is actually pretty good um, and uh, so we wanted to increase that when when you look at the problems that go on in, in um, uh, uh, any type of service of that in regard, one of the things you see is the dogs aren't getting walked enough, or there's no recreational area for the cats, and and uh, if they don't have that, they become kennel soured, and then uh, that's when you have to start looking at is this animal adoptable? Is this an animal that we could place in a home? And if they're not, then then the euthanasia side of it comes in. So. We, we believe that through some of our efforts, through some of them, um, uh, for example, right now we've already jumped in, we're using inmates to go out and walk the dogs, to take them out. We, uh, volunteers were limited, and uh, so we, we brought the inmates in and let them walk the dogs and socialize them. And uh, We've actually been doing this for a couple of years, not necessarily at the animal shelter, but we've had a Paws and Stripes programs in our jail where we take rescue dogs, partner them with female inmates, and the two of them go through um, a tough time together. The rescue dogs are taught through a program that we put on, uh, socialized uh, behavior and then obedience training. And the inmates learn to care and nurture for something and be responsible for something. So the two of them kind of help get each other through a, a difficult time. What about um, uh, school security? Mm -hmm. uh, that's another issue that came up that um, 
you know, the schools had their own security officer, and they did some things. Uh, I, I'm not altogether sure what they did, but I also right. know that the last time we talked, the sheriff's office had been working with the schools on tactical emergency response uh, types of things, and, and so it did seem to be make some sense to have the sheriff's office do that, but talk a little bit about what went into that decision. Yeah, you know, we're, we're, we're very active in that now. That, that program is in full swing now. Um, uh, lieutenant Mike Scully is our um, uh, uh, member of our member of our agency. Is our lieutenant that is actually I'm um, assigned to the school now for their school security and um, admin security, everything else. And it really kind of came off the heels even even before I um, took office. I'd already been elected, but hadn't taken office yet. Dr. Bingley and I were talking about school security, coming right off the heels of what had happened in Connecticut. Right. We were looking at ways that we could enhance school security. One of those ways was to um, to have site plans available for every school, and not only available, but have gone through them with our SWAT teams. When you look at our schools, they not only sit in the county, most of them sit in within the city limits. So mm -hmm. you have police departments that are responding. So we we started, kind of took the initiative of getting those site plans in order, getting um, a response for each individual school, because each school is different, and, uh, and looking at those things. And kind of off of that, fed into, well, you know, we've got a seamless delivery of information here. We've got a seamless delivery of services. And so it kind of really tied into, is it more beneficial to have an actual law enforcement officer that's working for an agency? Um, uh, you know, certainly we're the largest agency in Brevard County, so it was a perfect fit. The school board um, uh, looked at it, um, studied the proposal, and everybody agreed that this is a, a, a great way to tie everybody together. The other area that it looks like you're going to be getting involved soon, if not already, is the Port Canaveral. Mm -hmm. so it has, it has a police department, has had some for some time. I know it has not always been easy for them to have their own police department. Right. Big personnel operation uh, and the like, totally different from running a port. What went into to the decision? Uh, did they approach you? Did you approach them? They, they actually approached us, and uh, they, were, they were looking, um, the CEO, John Walsh, and the port commissioners, were um, being visionary. They were looking down the road five years from now at the expected growth of that port, all the all the cargo and everything else that's expected to start pouring into that port and looking at do we want to make the investment to grow our police department at the same rate that the, the port's expected to grow. And you're talking about a substantial investment to do that, probably somewhere upwards um, uh, eight to ten million dollars to create the infrastructure, if you will. The, the police department as its own uh, is, is actually um, had just become accredited. They were doing a great job. They've actually won several awards with the police department. It, it really came down to is the, is the infrastructure in place to support the growth that's forthcoming. When, when we talk about infrastructure, we talk about uh, things like crime scene, bomb units, uh, uh, SWAT team, uh, investigations. Uh, you have someone that, you know, you got training modules that come in. You've got someone that calls in sick. Do you have the immediate backup for them to be able to replace them? So all of those things in an in infrastructure aspect uh, would have been a substantial investment for them to go forward. So before they made that investment, they looked at some other possibilities of, of doing the same thing, making sure that there's no uh, loss in service, but making sure that they're doing everything they can to be fiscally sound as well as security sound. And port policing is a lot different. It is, um, it's not the every day of responding to calls. Port policing goes into a sense of um, security, making sure, in fact, redundant security. You're making sure that gates are locked and double locked and uh, at any moment, the captain of the Coast Guard can shut the port down if he feels like it's not a secure arena. So it's a whole different aspect of policing. But for the benefit for us was the model was already in place. Their police department had created a model that we, we now go in and, and quite frankly, if the model's in place, if everybody's following the uh, facility security plan, it doesn't matter if the uniform's blue or green. It matters how you apply it and how you do the job. And so. We, we submitted our proposal. It was substantial savings uh, annually for the port. In fact, um, looking forward at what their next year's budget would have been, uh, if their budget had been approved for that amount, uh, it would have been about a $1.2 million savings for them. So anywhere between wow. 500000 to um, a little over a um, million dollars in savings. And then you compound that out each year at the savings that's that's uh, associated with that and it's pretty substantial for the port so we're excited we um, we, we um, have a great relationship with the CEO and, and his team and and uh, you know anytime you have change 
it's, it's always um, uncertainty and it's always, uh, you know, people are uncomfortable about it, but once everybody gets in there and everything starts moving, it takes care of itself. Now, will you absorb the officers and, and staff that is already out there? Mm -hmm. uh, our, our goal is to um, uh, anyone that wanted to come over with the sheriff's office uh, to, to come with us. Uh, they, they already have the training. They already have the skill set. Obviously, they have to go through our background process because they're actually leaving one agency and coming to us. So they have to go through our background process and, and uh, our HR component. But our goal was to do that. Some of them uh, had taken the job. Some of them had retired from other uh, agencies and kind of took that job as a little bit less active, a little bit less fast-paced. And so they may not they may not come over. But uh, obviously, a lot of talent there, a lot of people there that. Um, are passionate about what they do and, and enjoy what they do. So we would always welcome that. Well, I understand that they had a, uh, there was some criticism a year or two ago about how the port was suffering high turnover. Uh, and on further reflection, it turned out that a lot of it was in their police department because mm -hmm. you know, there were people that were kind of on, on the cusp. There were either people that were coming up and aspiring to go work for the sheriff's office you know, our police department, when they could, they would, and or they were the people like you described who, yeah, maybe it was time for them just to, to move on at, to, into yeah. full retirement. And, you know, one, one thing that I don't think anybody um, uh, kind of looked at before, and it's, it's out now, is the police department makes up about 25%, or I should say the public safety department, makes up about 25% of the employees at the port. Right. And, uh, you know, the, the one of the thoughts that went into this was the CEO and the the commissioners wanted to be able to focus on de further developing the economic engine of that port, right. uh, fulfilling the vision that's there to make it just even better than it already is, which I, I think is phenomenal, the, the things that are going on out there. But um, uh, when you look at 25% of your workforce, you're also looking at uh, a large number of people that are taking and consuming a lot of your other time, your HR components, your your insurance and everything else that goes right. into it. So a lot of factors went into to play with it. And uh, you know, for us, we um, we're, we're excited about about working with them. It is um, it's a daunting task. I mean, port security is is uh, uh, very um, very focused. The facilities plan has to be followed to a T. And uh, you know, we, we want to make sure that every passenger that comes there, every vendor that goes there is, um, is safe and, and uh, not only is safe, but feels safe as well. Let's move on to crime fighting because I know that's what you're really into yeah. this business for. Any kind of new initiatives going on that, that, that you're working on that yeah, the Sheriff's you, Office is trying to tackle? Yeah, you know, we, um, we were really blessed this, um, this year. Um, FDLE released their uh, crime statistics and uh, in Brevard County, our crime rate went down in 2013. Our crime rate went down by 7.3 percent. Wow! And uh, you know we're we're excited about that. Uh, what was even more exciting is that when uh, you look at the crime rate per capita per hundred thousand, we had a lower crime rate uh, than than we've had since 2001, if I remember correctly, and we had fewer reported crimes than any time in the last 21 years. So you know that's that's what resonates with me is. The number of crimes that we're having reported. Um, our agents and in fact all of our law enforcement partners, not just our team, but uh, all of the police departments, they do a great job at solving the cases. But the big the big focus is to keep anybody from ever becoming a victim. Um, and so, you know, we look at that fewer reported uh, incidents. That's that's what really gives us a, a good um, idea of what we're doing. I, I, I attribute a lot of it to um, uh, aggressive law enforcement. I attribute a lot of it to our crime prevention task force that we started, that we're partnered with Melbourne and Palm Bay and Rockledge and, and uh, Titusville and, and uh, Coco, we, we basically started the crime prevention task force, one of the first in the country, where we put a task force together to prevent crime from happening versus putting a task force together on the backside to solve the crime. And so we're seeing great results from it. I always, um, I always caution everybody, now's not the time to let up. We got our boot on the, on the throat of crime. Let's keep it there and let's make sure that we're continuing to do the things that we're doing. But um, we're, we're excited about the crime rate coming down. We've started another program uh, that uh, is, is very active. We, we uh, delivered a lot. It's, uh, it's called BELT and it's Brevard Employee Lookout Team. We go into a place, for example, like the Florida Today, we come in here with your employees during a training session and we teach them about crime. We teach them what to be on the lookout for, what type of suspicious behavior they should they should be on the lookout for. Because they're here um, eight hours a day. Now, some of your bosses said you're only here like six hours a day, but Stop I don't that. know if that's, okay, that's not true. So, but um, they- um, 60 a week, maybe? <laughs> uh, no. Yeah, definitely. They, um, they're here eight hours a day, 
but they're in their neighborhood the rest of the time. They're at the movie theater or right. they're at the store. So we want them to be our eyes and ears. And uh, so we deliver this program called Belt, and uh, we ask them to call us and tell us what's going on, what they see. We give them different mechanisms to, to contact us, whether it's by phone, whether it's by Facebook, um, uh, by tweeting us, any of it is a mechanism for them to get in touch with us and give us the information. So we've got that going. We've got um, College Bound Safety, which um, is an exciting program that we started here. It uh, goes into the high schools and only talks to the seniors. And you know, our, our, our kids live under our protective umbrella their entire lives. We send them to college, they join the military, they move out on their own, and now they're in an aspect where they have to be responsible for protecting themselves. So College Bound Safety is about a 45 minute presentation that our crime prevention unit does that actually uh, tells them everything they need to be on the lookout for, for violent crime, identity theft, even alcohol and drugs. Uh, that puts it into total perspective of not only what to look out for, but how to protect themselves against it. So we, uh, we're, we're excited about that program. And then probably the, the, the last program that I would um, uh, say that we've come up with is just really taken, um, uh, taken off. It's called Time to Be a Parent Again. And it's a program that, that we started, and uh, it's a three-hour seminar that we put on. We've presented it now to over 2,000 parents. And it goes in and basically tells parents what they can do to hold their kids accountable for their actions, what they can do to make sure that their kids are being responsible and that, that when they do mess up, they understand there's consequences. And we look at it from this aspect. As a parent, we're raising the next generation of parent. And so we got to make sure we're doing it right. We've seen so many parents over the years that have kind of taken a hands-off uh, approach because they're scared they're going to get in trouble for disciplining their kid. And we, we started looking at, there's really, you got three options. And it sounds really hard to say, but there's three options. You can tough love your kid, you can go visit your kid in jail, or unfortunately you go see him in the cemetery. The, those are your three options. And, and we want our parents to understand that when you tough love your kid, you're holding them accountable. You're keeping them, you're keeping them where they're going to be safe out of harm's way. And so we started putting this program on. Probably the most dynamic part of it is it is um, the last uh, segment. We bring in our chain gang, and we set them on a stage, and the parents can ask them any question they want to ask them about where their life started to turn to crime, what their parents were like, and were they involved in their life? Did they have discipline? What drug did they do? Anything they want to ask, they can ask those inmates. And um, it's unscripted. We don't know what the parents are going to ask, and so the inmates just answer openly and truthfully mm -hmm. from their own life, um, their own life experiences. And I, I'm really proud of it. We just, um, uh, Steve Crisofoli, our um, uh, speaker designee, and our, our future Senate President, Andy Gardner, we went up and presented the program to them. It's the first of its kind, and uh, um, it's actually kind of a bold initiative that we're, we're saying, parents, you've got to get back involved in your child's life. And, and it really based on this. I shouldn't have to be the chief law enforcement officer in your kid's life. You are the parent, um, the grandparent, foster parent, whoever it is that's responsible for that child. So we went up and we presented it, and uh, they asked us to pilot it in central um, Florida to see if it's a program that they want to take on during their term to, uh, to make it a statewide initiative. So we're now partnering with Sheriff Judd out of Polk County, Sheriff Hansel out of Osceola County, and Sheriff Esslinger out of Seminole County. And uh, starting on probably around August, we'll be um, working with them to get them the program so they can present it in their area and see what kind of success we have with it. What's that program called again? It's called Time to Be a Parent Again. And how do people sign up for that if they want um, to? Then go to our website. Um, uh, we, we put up when we're doing them. Uh, we, we put on, um, in fact, um, we've already put on four or five this year. Um, we've got some coming up. I think the next one's scheduled in August or September. But we advertise on our website. It's free of charge. They go and... Um, uh, we, we actually have had parents bring their kids and, and watch it as well. So it's pretty compelling. It talks about um, parenting today versus yesterday. It talks about the challenges that parents face today versus yesterday as well. Wow. I mean, the drugs and things that you have to keep your eyes out for And, today and the are warning so much signs different. of that. Yeah. That's right. One of the more interesting things that we've, and fun things that we've done uh, and covered with your department in the last month or two has been the naming of a new police dog. Mm -hmm. uh, or it was a bloodhound, correct? Bloodhound, right. Yeah. Tell the story. Um, we, uh, we get, anytime we, we have a need for a bloodhound, if we're replacing one that's retired or, or we have a new vacancy in one, we, uh, we work with the Jimmy Rice Foundation and they give us a, a, a full-blooded uh, bloodhound to, uh, to come in. Our bloodhounds are tasked with uh, looking for missing children, looking for um, perhaps a senior that has walked away, 
Uh, in fact, we just used them down in West Melbourne with um, the, the gentleman that's still missing down there. We, um, we use them if, in the event that we did have an inmate escape, which doesn't happen. It um, uh, hasn't happened in a long time, I should say. But um, uh, they're trained to do scent searches. So they're looking for not only a person, they could look for an article. You could take my watch, throw it out in the woods, and they can go find it. Um, it's really, it's really uh, just amazing to watch these dogs work. But um, we, back in April of last year, we got a new bloodhound. And so we, we did a Name That Puppy contest. And it, it, it uh, generated a lot of energy, a lot of involvement from the community, which we love. We want our community to be involved with us. And so um, we ended up naming that one a little girl uh, by the name of Grace uh, actually gave us the Grace Stifler. Um, she, uh, she gave us the name of, of the dog, and it was Coda, which is uh, uh, Indian for friend. And it was really appropriate. So this time we got a new one, and uh, we decided we were going to do the Name That Puppy contest again. And it uh, just generated unbelievable attention. In fact, our posts on Facebook reached over 700,000 people that uh, saw the post and uh, generated 7,500 names that were submitted to, um, to wow. our team. So our, uh, our team uh, went in and started looking through the names and one of them just popped out immediately. And uh, back in 1991, uh, unfortunately, we had a, a, a tragedy where a young man by the name of Junie Rios Martinez was abducted and killed here in Brevard County. He's 11 years old, he was just a, a, a bright kid, a great, um, always had a smile on his face, loved to surf. And uh, that, that's um, stuck with a lot of people throughout the years uh, in, in uh, Brevard County. So a couple, actually about five people recommended we name the dog in honor of, of um, Junie Rios Martinez. So our team selected the name Junie and uh, we swore him in, I think last week or the week before, we actually did a little swear-in ceremony, which is unique to do with a dog. You really have to <laughs> witness that one time. But um, raise uh, your yeah. giant right hand. That's right, and and uh, bark. He's a big dog. Uh, so he is. He's going dog. to be a big dog. Yeah, he's um he's 14 weeks old right now. Our team's estimating he'll probably get somewhere around 110, 120 pounds is uh, his, his expected growth. What was really neat was the young lady uh, Raquel Santana that recommended the name. Uh, when we asked her why that name, she said that her father through the years as she was a young lady growing up in Brevard County would always remind her of the story about Junie and what had happened to him and, and the tragedy of it and so it just always echoed with her to to be safe and so we had her present to announce the name and then we actually had Junie's mom and dad and family there oh wow and they um, they pinned his badge on his collar for us so it was a very very moving ceremony um, and certainly I don't think you could have picked a better name for a, for a dog that's going to be saving kids lives one day so you had several people that came up with names. So you, I trust you had to go back, like a, looking for that needle in a haystack for that first person who came up with it. Like, you know, that's that's exactly right. Caller number seven yeah. kind of an approach. Um, our team went back, and, and when we found out there was about five people that had submitted the name, we said, well, the only fair way to do it is to pick the first one, and that was Raquel. And uh, so yeah. she was very, very um, flattered to, um, to get to name the dog and to be there. Well, it's a perfect name. Yeah. One of the other issues that's coming up, in the election is this issue of medical marijuana mm -hmm. and I understand that the Sheriff's Association including you mm -hmm. um, are opposed to this give me uh, we've got a couple minutes left give me a sure. sense of kind of where you're coming down on this issue yeah um, you know it's it's um, I, and I always kind of divide it into two there in fact just uh, just recently the um, Charlotte's Web medical marijuana aspect came up and and uh, was passed through the legislature and, and went into play. That's the kind yeah. that's low in THC. It's, that's it's more about the oil for treating epilepsy. Yeah, and, and it, it, um, it, the, the form that it's in goes under your tongue. It dissolves under your tongue. Um, I, I'll tell you right now, I would stand on the steps of the Capitol and support that. I, um, it helps kids with epilepsy. It helps adults from seizures and everything else. Right. Um, you know, we're all very compassionate and want to make sure that no one is suffering and that no one's in harm's way. And so I, I would stand in any, any form and, and support that form of medical marijuana. The, the problem that the Sheriff's Association foresees is not necessarily the concept. What the problem is, is the law that has been drafted, if you will, that's coming up on the ballot for November 4th, gives absolutely no control mechanisms, not only for, for law enforcement, it doesn't give any control mechanisms for the Department of Health or anyone else in it. Uh, anyone over the age of 21 can um, go and become a vendor for uh, medical marijuana, regardless of their background, anything of that nature. Uh, it gives no restrictions about age that medical marijuana can be uh, applied to. In fact, the way the law is written, uh, someone 12 years old can walk into a doctor's shop, because it's not going to be a regular physician's 
office that you're going to go to. It's going to be, for example, in a strip mall or someplace like that. You're going to go in and you can, you can get a recommendation. There's no prescription. It's a recommendation. You go next door to the dispensary with your recommendation and you can buy as much as you want. There's no limit on what you're buying or anything of that nature. So the, the concern for us is there is no structure in place that's going to control what's taking place. The bigger concern too is when you look at the language, it identifies a number of different conditions that can be uh, recommended for. But then it also has a part in it that says, or any other condition that a doctor feels outweighs the risks associated with medical marijuana. So essentially, you just gave carte blanche so that a doctor can go in and say, well, I think you have bad headaches, I'm gonna give you this. Or you hurt your back playing racquetball, I'm gonna give you this. And so what, what we're looking at is, if, if this is the way our society wants to go, if they feel that this is the appropriate measure, let's let our legislators do it. Let's let them create the right language that puts the measures in place and does it. And I, I tell everyone, um, I, oppose, I oppose the law both personally and professionally, but I, I would never be so bold as to tell our citizens how to vote. Um, in fact, I get to be sheriff because of how they vote, so they tell me how they want to vote. What I'm asking everybody to do is go become completely familiar with this um, uh, Florida Second Amendment. Completely familiarize yourself with it, see how limited it is in control measures, and then vote your heart. That's, that's what we're asking everybody to do is go, go educate yourself on the amendment and be fully aware of what you're actually voting for. Well, I can't ever argue with that advice. Yeah. Wayne Ivey, thank you so much my for pleasure. joining us Always in the studio today. So, thanks, man. That's our program. Remember, you can publish your feedback on anything you heard today or read in Florida Today by sending an email to me at letters at floridatoday.com. I'm Matt Reed. We'll see you right here next week on WEFS and floridatoday.com.